All right. Welcome, everybody. Welcome to session number 26 of La Morte d'Arthur. So we're doing another extra session here uh, because we didn't get to Elaine and Lancelot last time, which is fine. I wanted to do full justice to Sir Tristram and Sir Palamides before we leave them behind and begin. Uh, this is the, the sort of the start of the final turn, right? Uh, this is where things really do begin to turn. Uh, the story of Lancelot and the conception, the odd conception of Galahad, uh, which brings us straight down towards, um, uh, towards the quest for the Holy Grail, which we will begin next time, uh, and thence to the collapse of the court relatively quickly. Um, uh, I think we're going to be, um, <laughs> Karita suggesting that, uh, <laughs> suggesting a drinking game that, uh, uh you drink when somebody swoons. Uh, that's, uh, perilous, uh, in this section, I would definitely say. Um, <clears throat> but, um, anyway, yeah, um. Oh, cool. Devar, I'm so glad to hear that you are, uh, uh, you are, you are a, a Palamides fan for life now. Yeah, I mean, he's so good. I just love Sir Palamides. Um, you know, not in the same way. I know there are some people who dislike knights like Lancelot uh, or Tristram just on principle because, you know, they always win and they're like, you know... Often I find with modern audiences, you know, if you hold someone up as an ideal, then, you know, a lot of people just like dislike them on principle. Right. Because they're they're idealized. Um, you know, I've never been like that. I always I quite like Lancelot uh, in this uh, in this book. I think that uh, Mallory's Lancelot uh, is quite appealing, despite the fact that he is the hero and almost the best uh, in the world at everything. However, um uh, I, I definitely think that uh, Sir Palamides is a very remarkable character. Um, anyway, okay. Uh, so, but before we uh, before we get uh, too far into things, um, well, okay. Before I start my preamble, which I feel like I need to give um, before we get into things. But first, let me do some quick announcements. I've got moot announcements and things first, actually, and most urgently. Tomorrow tomorrow night at 8.30 p.m. Eastern Time is going to be the first Mythgard Movie Club of 2019. Uh, and uh, the team is going to be discussing the Blade Runner movie, the old Blade Runner movie, uh, so that then they can come back and discuss the new Blade Runner movie uh, uh, later on uh, in, in a, a couple months down the road. Um, so that's going to be really uh, a really fun sort of bookended discussion to discuss both of those. And again, the first part of that is going to be this week, tomorrow night, uh, this Thursday, as is Thursday, the 31st of January at 8.30 p.m. Eastern Time. So I hope you'll be able to join them for that. Uh, if you go to signumuniversity.org and scroll down to the events page, you'll see and there's a link, a registration link. Uh, it's, it doesn't cost anything, of course, to, uh, to come, but you can register to attend uh, and that'll be really cool. So, um, uh, that'll be, that'll be a lot of fun. And then of course we have some moot reminders, right? We've got, uh, we're coming into a, uh, our spring moot season, right? Uh, we've got, uh, we've got sunshine moot coming up in Orlando, Florida or near Orlando, Florida, uh, in on the 23rd of March. And we have Nader moot coming up in Leiden in the Netherlands on the 13th of April. Uh, so I hope that those of you who are in those areas will be able to join us for those. That's going to be a lot of fun. I'm, I'm looking forward to, uh, coming to both of those. Um, my, um, uh, my, uh, younger son actually is going to come and join me uh, for Sunshine Moot. I'm bringing him down to Orlando for his birthday, uh, which is like very like a week uh, after the moot. Uh, so um, uh, so anyway, yeah, yeah. So he, he's gonna he's gonna join me in Orlando for his birthday. It's going to be cool. Uh, and then uh, and then I'm going to the Netherlands and I'm probably not bringing my sons, though they both want me to. Uh, probably not this year, though. Uh, anyway, so that'll be that'll be great. Over, I've never been to the Netherlands before. Um, in fact, I've never been uh, anywhere uh, in Europe outside of, uh, outside of the UK. So, um, I'm, I'm excited. I'm excited to, uh, uh, to, to, to see Leiden and the Netherlands. Uh, it's going to be really cool. Veronica, no, we're not going to go to Disney world. Uh, we're going to, we're, we're only going to, we're going to have like one day down there the day before the moot. And, uh, I'm going to take him to uh, Harry Potter world. That's where he wanted to go. Uh, he wanted to do the universal Harry Potter thing. So we're going to have like celebrate his birthday with Harry Potter, uh, down there. So, um, 
Anyway, yeah, so that'll be, um, uh, so yeah, so Sunshine Moot the 23rd of April, or sorry, 23rd of March, and then Nader Moot on the 13th of April. Uh, and then, of course, Myth Moot, the big one, right? Our big celebration of the year, the moot that all of these other moots are just building up to. Um, Myth Moot from the 27th to the 30th of June. Last night in exploring the Lord of the Rings, uh, we were discussing what is now an absolute, you know, what I had mentioned kind of off the cuff a little while before, but it is now an absolute certainty that this is going to happen. Um, we need to reenact the flight to the Ford, uh, which we're going to do. Uh, not with real horses. I do suspect there will be coconuts involved, but uh, we're going to... Uh, anyway, we're going to reenact the flight to the Ford because there, there are some things that we need to understand a little bit better. I was trying to like do X's and O's and, and, and explain some of the things that I don't fully understand the Black Riders movements there. Um, and anyway, in the end, we just threw up our hands and I'm like, okay, we've got to... We've got to reenact this. So that's totally going to happen um, uh, at uh, Myth Mood this year, and it's going to be a lot of fun. So anyhow, um, uh, so those are the announcements. Lots of fun things coming up uh, soon here. Um, but now let us get to our Maori discussion uh, before. Oh, yes. And we do, you can look at the website for that. SignumUniversity.org slash MythMoot um, is where to go for that. And uh, so it, you will notice that it not only has the registration link where you can uh, where you can uh, uh, reserve your uh, your tickets for those of you uh, who are uh, who have already registered or are registering now. Um, you can't sign up for the lodging yet. We, there will be lodging there. And I strongly recommend that you get the lodging uh, there at the facility. First of all, it's, the price is, is heavily discounted. It's, it's, it's uh, uh, very inexpensive lodging. Um, and also, it's just it's kind of cool to be able to be there in the, in the compound with all the rest of us there for the, for the weekend. So um, uh, anyhow, yeah. So, so uh, that's, 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 that's one thing to remember when you're registering. But also there's the call for papers, right? So there's so many good ideas that you guys have during class. So many Maori papers we could have. So many Lord of the Rings papers we could have from observations folks have made. I hope to see lots of papers uh, and presentations uh, inspired by some of our really fun discussions here over this last year. Uh, lots of stuff to talk about. I'm going to submit a proposal this year. I'm really excited. Uh, I'm going to... Um, um, I'm going to be uh, 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 giving a talk on the, the the poetics and prosody of uh, modern rap music. I'm going to be looking at Eminem, actually really fascinated uh, by that. So anyway, uh, it's, uh, it's pretty cool. Um, <laughs> Karina's teasing me, saying that she keeps telling people... Uh, uh, that 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 you know, Signum is not a cult, and that by referring to the compound, I am undermining her arguments. I just mean like the facility. I don't know. Those of you who've been there know what I'm talking about, right? So where Mythmoot is held is at the National Conference Center. So it's this conference center, uh, and it's kind of uh, it's it's well, and it's 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 a strange kind of place, but it's really fun. Uh, and you know, it's like lots of like. Uh, dark and interwinding tunnels and then you get uh, to our rooms and anyway it's really cool uh, you you we, you know that your registration includes all of your meals for the whole time that you're there and uh, you know we'll all be you know hanging out together and it's gonna be a lot of fun so um, uh, interesting uh, Karita says it reminds her of the Stargate base okay all right I can see that um, I can see that uh, anyhow. Yeah, so um, uh, it also kind of reminds me uh, uh, of like a, a visual translation of, uh, uh, you know, like uh, the old text based like Zork games and stuff, you know, where you go to a hallway, like there are exits to the to the to the north, south, east and west. And, you know, nothing to tell the difference among any of them. It's all good. I totally know my way around the NCC now. Like I could give guided tours, sort of, but I still get lost. Um, <laughs> anyhow, on to Maori. So I called tonight's class Seeds of Hope and Despair, as, of course, both 
uh, the greatest glory of the Arthurian court and the final destruction of the Arthurian court are both set into motion during tonight's reading in the same series of events, that is, in the conception of Sir Galahad. Which is, of course, not a spoiler, as, or rather, the spoiler is not mine, right? Because, of course, everyone is well aware of the fact that this is going to happen. We ended class last time with that random hermit coming in, um, uh, you know, in loco Merlinus, you know, and saying, um, um, uh, saying, uh, you know, hey, uh, so the you know the, the the dude who is supposed to be sitting in the siege perilous is about to be conceived, um, and. Um, uh, you know, that's, um, that's, brace yourselves because that's about to happen. Um, so there's n- absolutely no secret about the future here, right? And it is that y- both Elaine and her father are actively, um, are actively conspiring at the, cons- you know, d- d- the whole goal is to conceive Galahad, right? So that's, that's, that's very clear. Um, anyway, here's the thing I wanted to bring up before we start. So, I there, there are several passages here. I have a hard time with some of what happens in today's reading. And I have a hard time because I can only think of two different ways to interpret them. And either one of them is very dissatisfying. Like either, either way of interpreting it is, is kind of unsatisfactory, really. Um, and it's hard for me not to feel like one way or the other, Mallory is dropping the ball here a little bit. Um, because again, and I, I, there's very little positive evidence to, to choose either way. So let me, let, me, uh, let me explain what I'm talking about. What I'm talking about is the question of the status, uh, like Gw- Lancelot and Guinevere's relationship status. Okay, so let's review. To this point, right, uh, it is, it's, I would call it an open secret if there were anything secret about it, but there's not, right? Um, it is openly acknowledged that there is a love relationship between Lancelot and Guinevere because that's fine. There's nothing wrong with that, so long as they love each other sinless, right? To use um, uh, Percival's phrase, right? When he was speaking so confidently about Tristram and Isolde and how obviously they must love each other sinless, and King Mark must be mistaken about that. Um, which, of course, we know to be, in fact, not true. But with Lancelot and Guinevere, we have never had any positive... There are lots of people who suspect, right? There are lots of people who accuse. But so far, all of the accusations that there is something inappropriate going on... And again, inappropriate just means sex, right? So, I mean, if they're sleeping together, that's bad and completely inexcusable. If they're not sleeping together, it's fine. Right. So it's either fine or it's a catastrophe, one or the other. And the difference between fine and catastrophe is them going to bed together. Right. So that really is the essential question about the status of Lancelot and Guinevere's relationship. He has maintained he has spoken very firmly about the fact that he Lancelot, that he does not believe in love paramours. Right. Which is the the, you know, the 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 very non um, platonic version of courtly love where uh, in fact getting into bed with your beloved is the entire point um so um okay the only positive accusations that we have gotten about the or that arthur has received right have come from either king mark or morgan le fay right uh and that the sources speak very heavily in fact remember we we saw King Arthur himself have this thought process, right? Um, he got the letter from King Mark saying, hey, uh, you know, Lancelot and Guinevere, you know, you might want to look into that, right? And Arthur's first response was like, oh, that's really bad. Maybe there's something going on there, right? They do kind of love each other, and then we've kind of all talked about that for a long time. Um, but then he has second thoughts, right? And he's like, well, but then again, the people saying this, Morgan Le Fay, King Mark, are all 
openly malicious and completely villainous uh, and have lots to gain from just fomenting, uh, you know, confusion. And uh, they're trying to bring about the destruction of my court. So maybe this is not actually, you know, a um, an objective source uh, that is really totally reliable. Right. So, OK. So up until this moment, right, up until the Elaine story begins, we have had no indicator, again, apart from the suspicions slash accusations voiced by the villains, there has been no indicator that there is, in fact, anything inappropriate between Lancelot and Guinevere at all. I, I, just, I, 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 I see nothing that we can build anything on. OK, that's fact number one. <laughs> fact number two. Um, and this is something I'm just going to ask you to take my word on for a while. Um, them having been sleeping together for years does not fit very well, I think, with what we're going to see later on uh, it, after the quest for the Holy Grail. Third, now we get this section. So... Uh, and exactly the uh, and this is why I wanted to bring this up because I knew I know we're going to get like distracted into this right away. So I just kind of wanted to address this big issue before we get to the particular passages. Stephen, that is exactly the um, exactly the 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 issue. Right. Stephen Cover says he's very quick to get into bed with someone he thinks is Guinevere uh, for someone so adamant about sticking to non-physical love. Yes, um, that's exactly my issue. Right. In this section of the text, in the Lancelot and Elaine section here at the end of the Book of Sir Tristram, Lancelot and Guinevere appear to be um, kind of casual about sleeping together, which means one of two things must be... So So there are two, two ways that we can interpret this, right? Number one, they've been sleeping together for a long time. Right. This is not new. And so Guinevere's like, hey, honey, come to bed. Right. And he's like, well, don't mind if I do. And he's like, oh, but it's Elaine. But I think it's Guinevere. So I'm sure it's fine. Right. So that's why everyone is like, you know, Lancelot doesn't Lancelot in this fragment of text does not treat it like it's a huge deal. You would certainly not get the impression from this text. Uh, again, the text we're discussing here tonight that Lancelot is like, and this is the momentous occasion on which our love finally crosses the line, right? We've had this love, and it's been fine to this point, but now the transgression has finally occurred, and now I have fallen, and I'm doing that, and like that, I am now, I am turning away from all of my protestations and all of my, you know, but the virtue I have espoused and everything, and I'm fine. We don't get the sense that anything momentous like that is happening, right? Okay, so that's, so if, in fact, we are to understand so now, one thing that you will notice, or well, I don't know if you did notice, but in case you didn't notice, Lancelot and Guinevere do not, in fact, sleep together during this entire section, right? There are two attempts to sleep with Guinevere, but, uh, you know, Lancelot gets off on a technicality in both cases in that he has sex with Elaine instead both times, right? So we, in fact, have no sexual congress happening between Lancelot and Guinevere at any point during tonight's reading. Okay, so, but again, if he intends, right, to, but, but again, like the transgression, like his decision to be like, okay, I'm going to go, I'm going to go sleep with the queen. That seems like a big deal. You'd think he'd make a bigger deal of that. Right. So if it were the first time, again, you'd think he would treat it a little bit differently than this. But here's my problem. I don't find the other reading satisfactory either. That is, if we take this as evidence that they've been sleeping together all along, then I find everything else that's led up to this just as unsatisfying, right? Um, because um, you can say, but if this were the first time or attempted first time, right, for them to sleep together, you'd expect the narrator to make a bigger deal of it, right? Well, yeah, but I'd also say I'd have expected the narrator to make a bigger deal of it further back, right? Uh, I mean, it's been, he has been... Are we to believe that Lancelot is openly hypocritical all of this time, right? That he is 
he has been claiming that he is virtuous, that he's no, no loving paramours for me, and yet he's really been sleeping with Guinevere this whole time? Because if that's true, that's kind of a big deal. That's really a big deal, actually, I think. And the fact that nothing has been said to suggest that to this point seems to me at least as odd as the complete lack of fanfare with which he seems prepared to hop into Guinevere's bed during this section. Um, uh, so, um, uh, that's what I meant when I said I find either reading of that really kind of unsatisfactory. And so in the end, it's hard for me to be like happy at all with this whole section of the text. Um, and I, I feel like I can explain it but I can only explain it in like a crit ficky way, right? I can only go back and say, well, I, can, I, I mean, I can speculate about how this might have come to be, right? But it's just pure, spe well, not quite pure speculation, but no, it's, I mean, speculation like crit fic always is. He's being faithful to his sources here. Um, he is drawing the, the story of, um, you know, Lancelot and Elaine from the French books. And in those French books, Lancelot and Guinevere are sleeping together all along. Right. His departure from his sources was Lancelot's earlier protestation. And remember, we talked about that at the time, that his whole counter to the, you know, his whole stand, moral stand counter to the culture, uh, the traditional culture of courtly love is weird. Like that is different. That is a that is a deviation from his French sources by Mallory. That's not uh, it, sometimes it's quite the opposite of the French Lancelot's perspective. The French Lancelot is like the perfect courtly lover, which means he's going to sleep with his lady, right? And so the only question is, like, when this comes out in the open, it's going to lead to political problems, which is, of course, what eventually happens. And so the story of the fall of Arthur in the older versions, right, in the older French versions, is this continuous um, uh, progress of the wonderful, glorious court, but it's got this dirty secret that everybody knows but Arthur, right? And even there's even sometimes some implications that Arthur kind of knows, but he doesn't want to know officially, because if he officially knows, then, like, then he's got to do something and he doesn't want to do it. So, you know, like, it, it, it's, you know, it's that kind of tension and ambiguity is sort of the story, right? And then when it comes to the surface, right, and is brought out, dragged out into, uh, into the open, that's when you get, you know, uh, uh, unsolvable difficulties and ultimately the collapse of the court. Mallory, for a while, looked like he was wanting to push the story in a very different direction, right? The direction where that's not happening with Lancelot and Guinevere. Again, it's still going to end up being the issue, but he just didn't want to play it like that. He didn't want to have the two of them sleeping together for years uh, and only just hoping that Arthur doesn't find out or doesn't, you know, blow the whistle on him, right? Um, Mallory set out to, it seems, again, based on everything that we saw up to this point, um, he, was tr he was taking the story in a different direction. Now he goes back to just being essentially faithful to the French version, to the old version of the story in which they're sleeping together. And it's my opinion that he's going to kind of snap back out of that again once we get to uh, the Holy Grail and post-Holy Grail sections um, of, uh, of the text. Um, well, especially the post-Holy Grail uh, sections of the text. So that's why I find this sort of unsatisfactory. Again, it seems to me to challenge continuity either way. Um, again, if it's the first time they're sleeping, or, you know, if, 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 if he is crossing a line here, it's not handled very well. Um, if he has already crossed the line and has been a hypocrite from the beginning, well, that hasn't been handled very well or very clearly either. Uh, so in the end, I just don't end up being happy with uh, a lot of this section, at least with that element of this section. Um, so 
given that I find both readings unsatisfactory, I will tell you the one that I choose, essentially. I choose the one which fits with the ends, which, which fits with the bookends, the beginning and the end of Lancelot's story, right? And that is that he, the two of them are not sleeping together, in fact, all the way through. So although the narrator might choose to treat it in a very cavalier fashion because he's being faithful to his, uh, to his source uh, here, sort of mysteriously faithful to his source. Um, I still prefer myself to choose the reading that says they have not slept with each other yet. That choice will have, I, and, I, and I make that choice because it has a good payoff later on. Um, if we make the contrary choice, in my opinion, I think it undermines what Maori does at the end, or at least it doesn't really fit as well, and it certainly doesn't make the ending as satisfying. In my opinion, it's a better story if we read it that way. So I wanted to bring all this out into the open before we got there, because I knew that when we get to those passages, it's going to be an issue. So thought better to just kind of go over that from the beginning. Um, yeah, yeah. Um, okay. Jennifer says it must have been hard for him to find any different way to produce Galahad. Jennifer, I agree that to some extent Lancelot's position, that is, you know, his stance, right, his moral stance, does kind of make the conception of Galahad a bit of a challenge, right? Um, either he has to be suffering a moral lapse, right? Um, one way or another, or multiple ways at the same time, in which case, you know, the, the conception of Galahad is a bit of an asterisk next to it, right? Or, you know, he's got to, like, make up something entirely different, like it happened, you know, he's completely ensorcelled and happens utterly against his will and, like, without his knowledge. And uh, anyway, yeah, it's, it's, it's a difficult situation, Jennifer. I still don't think, again, and I, this is, um, I think I've said before the, you know, the Emperor Lucius section, the part where he suddenly shifts to the alliterative Mort Arthur is my least favorite part uh, of Le Mort d'Arthur. Uh, this is my second least favorite part uh, because, again, I don't think that it, um, to me, it really just kind of doesn't work one way or another. Um yeah, cool. Matthew Hirschenroder asks, if Guinevere were to send for Lancelot and say, have sex with me, would Lancelot be obligated to sleep with her? No, no, um, no, he wouldn't be. I mean, it would be a conflict, right? I mean, he would want to obey his lady and he would want to please his lady. And if she's making an ultimatum, then like, you know, it's awkward. But, you know... If your lady is saying, commit a mortal sin and also treason against your monarch, like, you can say no to that, right? Like, the correct answer to that is, oh, well, honey, let's maybe talk that over a little bit, right? Maybe we need to think this through somewhat more. Um, uh, you know, obligation to blind compliance is uh, not, would not be a thing in that kind of an instance, really. Um but, uh, yeah, yeah, um, yeah, um, <laughs> all right, let's, let's, let's get, uh, lots of people asking different questions, which are going to relate to the passages we're talking about. So I'm not disregarding your questions, but let's, let's actually just go on. So better to deal with this with actual text in front of us, uh, than to keep talking out of the air like I've been doing. Okay. All right. Uh, so this is the passage that we ended with. I just wanted, in case I wanted to talk more about this, but I don't think I do. Um, one little thing that I wanted to point out before we get any further into this, because of course it's going to be really important when we get to the Holy Grail section. Um, this strikes to a very common misunderstanding about the quest for the Holy Grail, right? Um, a lot of people, including certain members of a British comedy troupe in the 1970s um, 
a lot of people operate under the f- the sort of false understanding that the point of the quest for the Holy Grail is to find the Holy Grail. That's not what the quest for the Holy Grail is about. And the thing that I wanted to draw your attention to is um, the thing that I want that, that I want to draw your attention to is the verbs. Look at the verbs that are used when people talk about the Grail, like what the knights who are on the quest for the Holy Grail are trying to do. Find is not a common one, right? Um, he shall win the Sank Grail is the prophecy that the hermit makes here, right? He's going to win it. Now he's going to find it. And of course, as we see, like we're going to see the Holy Grail a bunch of times here, right? It's not exactly lost. Um, it's not like it's, it's a, you know, in an obscure location and nobody knows where it is. Um, that's not what the, the, in fact, the Holy Grail is like everywhere. People trip over it all over the place, or rather it trips over them. Um, so it's not about, it's not about locating the Holy Grail. It's about winning the Grail. And another important verb, which we will see a lot is achieving the Holy Grail, right? Um, yes, yes. Um, Nancy, exactly. Uh, achieve is the Middle English version. Yeah, it means achieve. Um, Absolutely. Absolutely. Um, so, become worthy of the grail. That's more along the kind of direction that we're looking at, right? It's, um, and what that even means, because it's not about possession, right? It's not like the grail is the prize that's given out to the person who wins the gree, right? Like a, a, as if it were like a tournament prize or something like that, right? So it's not win the Sankriol in that sense, like you would win, you know, the teddy bear at the ring toss at the carnival, right? Uh, it's not winning in that sense. Um, uh, so exactly what sense that is, what this is, I, I'm, don't try to guess right now because we don't have enough data for that. I just wanted to draw your attention to the fact that that is an interesting and important thing. One of the things that I want us to be looking at throughout our classes, and I think we're going to have three classes, at least that's my plan, uh, on the quest for the Holy Grail section, um, you know, on the Sankriel stuff, I should start using Mallory's term, this sort of pseudo-Anglo-Norman Sankriel uh, uh, word that he uses there. Anyhow, um, we, uh, yeah, yeah. So just be paying attention to, you know, one of the questions I'm going to be having throughout that, one of the things that I want us to be looking at is like, what does it mean to be in the quest for? Like, what do you, how do you know when you achieve? What does achievement accomplish? What is, what are the qualifications for it? How does this work? This is going to be, um, uh, a big part of what we're doing, especially, well, I was going to say especially in the early part, but no, really all the way through uh, the quest for the Holy Grail. So I just wanted to kind of flag it for your attention uh, as we as we move forward. Um, okay, cool. Um, so let's let's keep going, or rather, let's begin. So Lancelot comes to this place, this castle, right, and discovers there's a bit of a challenge here. Ah, fire knicked, said they all. Here is within this tower a dolorous laddie that hath been there in pines many winters and dies, for ever she boileth in scalding water. And but lat, said all the people, Sir Gawain was here, and he meeked not help her, and so he left her in pine still. Peradventure, so may I, said Sir Launcelot, leave her in pine as well as Sir Gawain. Nay, sighed the people. We know well that it is ye, Sir Launcelot, that shall deliver her. <laughs> and the people say, No, we, we don't we don't do suspense, Sir Launcelot, right? Everybody knows exactly what's gonna happen in advance around here. Which is totally true. Like this is the land where there are no secrets about the future. Uh well, sighed Sir Launcelot, then tell me what I shall do. And so anon they brought Sir Launcelot into the tower. And when he come to the chamber thereas this laddie was, the doors of iron unlocked and unbolted. And so Sir Launcelot went into the chamber that was as hot as any stew. And there Sir Launcelot uh, uh, took the f- firest laddie by the hond that ever he saw. And she was as knocked as a needle. One of my favorite phrases. 
doesn't quite redeem this whole section, but uh, I can put up with a lot for the phrase naked as a needle. And by enchantment, Queen Morgan le Fay and the Queen of North Gallus had put her there in that pinus because she was called the firest laddie of that country. And there she had been five year, and never meet she be delivered out of her pinus unto the time the best kneeked of the world had taken her by the hond. Then the people brocked her clothes, and when she was a riot, Sir Launcelot thought she was the firest laddie that ever he saw, but if it were Queen Guinevere. Okay. Um, so, Carita, when they all know the future the way that they appear to do, I think the point is not necessarily that all of them, you know, have the vision of Merlin, or rather that, you know, or that, like, Merlin has left them a very extensive set of guilt notes, but rather um, it's their confidence in him. Right. So like it's apparently the notices isn't actually explained very clearly. Right. But like the best knight in the world is the one who can deliver the lady. Right. Um, and it's so Lancelot is being humble. Right. He's like, well, you know, yeah, I might not be able to succeed at this either. And they're like, oh, come on. Stop, Josh and Sir Lancelot. Right. We all know that you are the one to do this. Right. Um. So, yeah, no, she's uh, she's like stuck, Stephen. It's not just about the door. It's about the water. It's an, it's a curse, right? She's been cursed to be sitting in boiling water for five years, which is really horrible, right? That's very terrible. Um, uh, the torment that she has been in for five years, apparently. And there are a couple things here. This is Morgan Le Fay who did this, right? And there are two... Um, there are two conclusions that I would point to here, uh, sort of unstated things. One is, again, I would like to point to that the evidence that we have here for this sort of um, uh, larger um, feminine story, right, that is of which we get evidence at certain points, like we know about the nightly worship, right? And the leaderboard and everything. And we get a lot of talk about that. We get some evidence from La Belle Isode sometimes, from Guinevere sometimes, from other ladies, and from Morgan Le Fay on other occasions, that there's also this sort of parallel system of worship among the ladies. We don't know the rules for that, ne nearly like we know the rules for the men. Uh, nor do we know exactly what the rankings are. Beauty, obviously, is a big part of it, but it doesn't seem to be exclusively about, you know, just merely a beauty pageant. There seems to be more to it as well. Um, that is, women can gain worship and status within this world, uh, but we don't know exactly how. So um, the mere fact that we get Morgan Le Fay, who is obviously envious right, of Elaine, because Elaine is so beautiful. Um, the envy of Morgan Le Fay here seems, it, it's like, it's a familiar thing, right? We saw envy as, you know, one of the primary features of the Arthurian world on the masculine side, right, with uh, uh, Sir Palamides being the primary uh, uh, struggler with that, um, with that issue, though we certainly saw it creep up in many others as well, uh, and leading to the sort of factionalization of the court, right? Uh, remember even Lancelot's kin thinking about hunting down and killing Sir Tristram out of envy for all the worship he was winning, which was, you know, uh, challenging Lancelot's place on the leaderboard at number one, right? Um, and then Lancelot, of course, remember, had uh, would uh, not accept that in any way. So that's one thing that we see here. Again, there's this sense that, um, you know, this is part of that female business, which Lancelot is kind of stumbling into at the end of the of the game. Right. And, and, and we don't really know exactly how that came to be and how this was set up exactly. But of course, there's another thing, too. Um, Morgan Le Fay is very cunning 
And notice the situation that is created here. We know she has done a bunch of things. Remember the business with the sh Sir Tristram and the shield, right? Where she made him, made Sir Tristram uh, promise to carry the shield into battle. And the shield was like an indictment of Lancelot and Guinevere. And so we know that she's been trying to cause trouble. Uh, we know that she's been trying to kill Sir Lancelot and Sir Tristram. These have all been her goals, all of which have failed so far. But notice what she has set up here. So she's found this super beautiful damsel. And she not only uh, appears to be env envious of her. Remember, it's her and the Queen of North Gallus, right? Um uh, who did this to her. And you'll remember that those were two of the four sorceresses who captured Lancelot and said he had to choose which of them he wanted to take uh, for Paramore way back in the book of Sir Lancelot earlier on, right? Um, so anyway, uh, but notice that Morgan Le Fay has essentially contrived this whole situation. She set a curse on Elaine that only Lancelot could take off and... <laughs> Only Lancelot could break the curse if Lancelot comes and takes the hand of this absolutely gorgeous and completely naked damsel and takes her out of the bathtub, right? Um, like that. So she has created a situation which compels Lancelot to be in to be uh, inside the personal space of an extremely beautiful and highly naked damsel, right? Which seems like a stirring up of the pot. Right. Um, like she's trying to create a situation, uh, perhaps such as like the one that might possibly come about uh, as a consequence, you know, uh, uh, with Guinevere becoming jealous and all that kind of thing. Um, so um, it seems very likely that some of the things that do, in fact, come from this curse that is laid upon Elaine are, in fact, anticipated and even planned by Morgan Le Fay herself. Um, uh, or at least again, if, if not, I'm not claiming that she is all knowing and had every step of this all worked out in advance, but rather we see her kind of casting seeds all over the place, right? Starting plots, which some of which will hopefully end up in Lancelot's death or in, uh, the exposure of Lancelot and Guinevere or whatever. Right. Um, and this scene, and we've seen many of those come to nothing or be foiled by other people. Uh, and this seems to be one which is bearing an unusual degree uh, of fruit. Now, Arthur, I don't, it's, it's, it's the weirdness of the simile naked as a needle that I find so delightful. Um, I mean, it's fun because it's alliterative, right? Though alliteration has not been a really dominant thing in Mallory's linguistic choice so far. He hasn't really uh, tended towards alliteration much other than back in the Emperor Lucius section when he was uh, working directly from the alliterative Mord Arthur. But uh, for most of the rest of it, he's not been doing a whole bunch of alliteration. Um, uh, but anyway, yeah, um, I'm not really sure why Needle here. Um, but it's um, but it's fun, right? Uh, it's... it's uh, it's fun. Yeah. Um, yeah. Uh, Nancy does feel, I don't know if it's exactly un like exactly, but it's memorable, right? And not just because it involves nudity, but uh, naked as a needle. Um, I, I could just, that's not where I would have thought that simile was headed. Um, yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah, Steve and I do agree with you that, um, you know, Stephen says the fact that it works out so perfectly almost makes me think it wasn't an intended uh, consequence of the plot and that uh, Morgan Le Fay was mostly driven out of pure spite. No, yeah, absolutely. I, again, I don't think, I think that if we imagine her having sort of scripted this whole thing and, you know, pulling everybody's strings, um, you know, in a really detailed way from behind the scenes, I think that's giving Mallory's Morgan Le Fay a little bit too much credit. But she's persistent. You do have to give her that kind of credit. And I think the idea of like the idea that she would be deliberately throwing Lancelot into this situation. Right. Let's uh, put Lancelot in a place where he's got to, uh, you know, again, <laughs> to invade the personal space of a naked, incredibly gorgeous damsel. And we'll see what happens. Right. Because 
maybe nothing, but if anything does happen, it's got to be bad. Uh, so that's good, right? I mean, I, that I can easily see uh, 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 Morgan thinking, and it certainly works out very, very well. Um, yeah, Matthew points out that the simile is extra fun since you use a needle to make clothes, right? Uh, so, yeah, yeah, I mean, it is, it's, it's like associated, it would be associated primarily, wouldn't it, with... Um, um, the tailor's needle. Uh, so it's, it's in that sense, a kind of ironic, um, uh, simile, right. Um, she's naked as a needle in that she doesn't have anything that you could stick a needle in. Right. Um, uh, yes. Yes. David Erbach recollection, recollections of any, uh, uh, thinking about passing through the eye of a needle is probably inappropriate here. I, I, I do totally agree, uh, with that. Um, yeah. Um, OK. Um, now, yes, Tarlonio uh, and Crystal Leo went on uh, Twitch having an excellent discussion. Uh, and uh, Tarlonio was just pointing out what I find a very interesting fact. Twice, Sir Lancelot is quite taken with the beauty of Elaine. Right. The very first response that we get from Lancelot um, is that he 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 notices how beautiful she is. Right. Um, we are told that when he sees her arrayed, right, when she comes in dressed in her rich princessly apparel, um, that she was the fairest laddie that ever he saw, but if it were Queen Guinevere. Um, you know, except maybe for Queen Guinevere, she's the most beautiful woman he's ever seen. But as Tarwonio points out, the first time, it doesn't have that qualification, right? Um... And there Sir Launcelot took the firest laddie by the hond that ever he saw, and she was as knackered as a needle, right? So I, I, I don't think it's just that, like, without her clothes, she's even more beautiful than Guinevere. When she's dressed, you know, then Guinevere's a little bit uh, more attractive. But uh, 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 when she's in the needle-like state, then, uh, uh, then she... I don't think that... <laughs> I, I doubt that that's the intention here, but the repetition is clearly important, right? We can see, we are clearly meant to see that Lancelot has a notion here, right? We have never had any reason to suspect that Lancelot, even for a moment, strays. Uh, again, even in thought from Guinevere. And it is very clear, uh, and this is clearly important, right, that when he first and second sees Elaine both times he has an ocean, right? Wow. Okay. You know, whoo. All right. Yeah, I agree. Stephen Guinevere's clothes must be nicer. Agreed. Yeah. Um, yeah. Um, <laughs> Torah stroke is wondering how many naked ladies Lancelot has ever seen a question to be asked, right? I mean, um, uh, uh, it's not impossible that this is his first, I was about to say his first exposure to, but that's probably not the right word to use. Uh, this might be his first experience, uh, possibly. Given the frequency with which we saw ladies throwing themselves at Sir Lancelot throughout the book of Sir Lancelot, I'd be a little bit surprised if he's never seen uh, uh, a, 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 a needle like lady before um but uh it's conceivable right um and patricia yeah uh running with my reading my my a reading of this uh of this whole passage he would not have seen guinevere naked um yes yes um, and Nancy, I agree, like uh, running into a naked lady on some of the quests that he's been would be totally par for the. I mean, we're talking about a guy who is imprisoned by the necrophiliac sorceress. Right. So he's like he's had experience. This guy's known the world. Right. Uh, he may still be a virgin, but he is has had plenty of varied experiences over the course of his career. Um, yeah. OK, so. Let's continue on. Having rescued Elaine, he now proceeds to the next challenge. Sir Knecht, sin ye have delivered this laddie, ye must deliver us also from a serpent, which is here in, the, in, in a tomb. Then Sir Launcelot took his shield and sighed, Sirs, 
bring me thither, and what I might do to the pleasure of God and of you I shall do. So one Sir Launcelot come thither, he saw written upon the tomb with letters of gold, and said thus, Here shall come a liberd of king's blood, and he shall slay this serpent, and this liberd shall engender a lion in this foreign country, with uh, which, I think, sorry, which lion shall pass all other knictes? So when Sir Launcelot had lift up the tomb, there come out an horrible and a fiendly dragon, spitting wild fire out of his mouth. Than Sir Launcelot drew his sword and fought with that dragon long, and at the last, with great pain, Sir Launcelot slew that dragon. All right. Um, notice that um, again he's in the land where. He's in, like, the land of spoilers, right? So not only does the inscription on the tomb spoil the combat he's about to enter, but it then, like, talks about uh, the engendering that is to come very clearly. And, yeah, it's a leopard. Liberd is a leopard. Yeah. Uh, and we've seen this metaphor before, right? Leopard and lion we should be able to parse. Remember, this was, um, we got this just recently. We got this at the tournament of Lana Zepp. So remember when you had the four knights, the four green knights who came in together, right? Tristram and Palamides and Dinadin and Gareth, right? And they're all four of them doing marvelously and the people on Arthur's side don't know who they are. Remember that passage when Lancelot and Arthur are watching uh, the four, you know, them uh, uh, attack the Orcish knights, right? And, uh, and they say, oh, the knight with the white horse, who is Tristram. I th I'm forgetting the colors of the horse. But anyway, the, the one who is Tr Sir, Sir Tristram, would say, he is like a lion. And the other one, who is Sir Palamides, is like a leopard. And the other two are like two wolves. So, And that's pretty clear, a pretty clear indicator of the like uh, hierarchy of imagery here, of like heraldry here. The lion is the one who is most valiant, right? And then the leopard is like the lion, but not quite as strong as the lion, right? Second place to the lion, but still, but, and the wolves, they're good too, but they're not, they, they're not in the same league as either the leopard or the lion, right? So we see again, leopard and lion, except of course, in this case, slightly shockingly, given the state of the leaderboard for the last uh, who knows how many years, as if there is one element which Mallory is utterly unconcerned about in writing his story. It is chronology, right? Uh, and nowhere more than in this section. Did you notice how Galahad aged 15 years in two years? Like Lancelot is gone for two years and then he comes back and, and, and Galahad's 15 years old, right? It's, it's fine. Just, just roll. Just roll. It's fine. Don't worry about it. Um, but, uh, but anyway, um, so... He's a leopard, and he's going to uh, engender um, a lion. And he's going to slay the serpent in the meantime. And yet, uh, um, who was it? Yes, Devorah, you're right. We have our wildfire again, right? Just like we saw the wildfire before. Um, yeah. Ooh, I like that theory, David, that Galahad was raised in fairy where time progresses differently. That would explain, that would be a really tidy way to fix a lot of problems. Uh, in, uh, like, remember <laughs> Alexander uh, Le Orphelin, right? I mean, uh, same problem. Um, anyway, okay. So. What strikes you about this scene, this particular task? First of all, it's interesting because Lancelot's fighting a dragon. Um, you get the impression from hearing modern stories about the Middle Ages, like a lot of modern people seem to be under the impression that a brave knight rescuing a, like, and a lot of uh, 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 Disney writers also, you know, and like Shrek and all sorts of things. 
right? All seem to be under the impression that the, the prototypical medieval story is a knight slaying a dragon to rescue a damsel, right? Um, in fact, that almost never happens uh, throughout the entirety of the Middle Ages. This is the only dragon. Um, really? I think the only dragon, like legit dragon, real dragon, not heraldic dragon. We got the dream dragon, right? Arthur dreamed about a dragon. Uh, remember fighting the boar bear um, uh, back when he was invading, uh, you know, Rome. Um, but we haven't met a real dragon. There's the questing beast, which is sufficiently cool, right? But um, uh, but it's it's you know we haven't met a real dragon yet, and th this is a this is a legit dragon, right? It's a real dragon. Um, Veronica, yeah, it's really more about Saint George, uh, the legend of Saint George, and I would also say the influence of the Fairy Queen as well. Book one of the Fairy Queen is all about going to slay a dragon, and that's a straight up allegory, um, uh, and that was extremely influential, but it's also not medieval, right? It's Elizabethan. Um, but, uh, yeah, the, is St. George medieval? Yes. Yes, the story of St. George is medieval, but um, St. George is worse than Robin Hood for, like, not having a, like, authoritative... It's just one of those stories that none of the major, like, medieval writers, at least anyway, in a work that survives, really kind of took up, right? Um, it's mostly like tradition um, and little clear narrative. Um, and Brian, I agree, he doesn't seem that interested in this story. Uh, he passes it over very quickly and Lancelot doesn't seem very challenged by it. I, I totally agree. Um, but you'll know what's happening. You notice what's happening here? Um, what's happening here? take these elements by themselves. Let's back up from Maori's depiction of them. If we take these things in isolation, an interesting picture emerges. The tomb. Right? Um, Lancelot opening a tomb goes back to Cretien de Troyes. Uh, in Cretien's Lancelot, this is... Uh, when I remember Cretien... Cretien is the guy who invented the character of Lancelot. Um, so in the very first story of Lancelot, um, the lifting up of a tomb, of a stone tomb, like opening up a stone tomb, is the thing that Lancelot does which first establishes him as something awesome. Everybody thinks he's really shady prior to that. Um, and the first time he appears to be the Knight of Destiny... Um, is when he opens a tomb. But there are two important things about that tomb in Cretien's work which are lost by the time we get to Maori's version of it here. Uh, thing number one, there was a prophecy attached to this tomb that, like, nobody can open this tomb except the knight who is destined to go and do this amazingly awesome thing, right? Um, and then Lancelot comes by, and, you know, and so that, you know, there's like, you know, hermits and monks and stuff there, and they're like, oh, you know, you won't be able to, and he goes over and he's like, like this? Oh, open, closed, open, closed. I say, so he, he, he just opens it really easily, right? And they're all like, oh, he's the one, right? So it, that's a big deal. There's no, uh, even, there's more portent, there's more portentousness to the delivery of Elaine, right? Uh, than there is to the two. I mean, they're like, since you've delivered the lady, you should also deliver us from this serpent. But it's more like, it's, this is, this whole quest is given to him almost, it, it kind of makes me sound like, you know, the quest at the beginning of, of of an RPG when, you know, you go to the tavern and they ask you to go to the cellar and clean out all the rats, you know, down there. It's almost like that. Like, since you're here, you also should perform this other side quest for us, which is there's a serp, there's a dragon. You should probably kill that. Thank you for exterminating uh, the dragon problem. Um, but um, anyway, 
so again, it's not it's not made as portentous, even as the delivering of uh, Elaine was. So that's one way in which it's changed. The other super important element of the tomb in Cretien's version, it's his own tomb. Like it's like the tomb is like Sir Lancelot on the side of the tomb. Like it is his own tomb that he opens. And thus, that is also not only the first time that we see him as like the Knight of Destiny, it's also the first time that he becomes a clearly messianic figure, which be, is a very big deal through the whole rest of that poem. Um, here, he just opens a tomb because the tomb happens to be the box in which the dragon is kept, right? Somehow continuing to be viable inside there. Um, so, anyhow, um, but he's still opening a tomb, which is interesting. And the inscription on it is not his own name. It's a prophecy about what's going to happen. And as so many of the prophecies around here is obsessed, not with Lancelot so much, but with Galahad specifically. Um, but let's talk about the serpent. Cretien has no dragon, right? Um what are we, what should we be thinking? We've got a serpent, right? Um, we've got a fire breathing serpent, a dragon. What are we thinking of? We've got a dragon associated with tombs. What do we do with that? Yeah, um, some of you, and especially I know many of you are Tolkien fans who have been trained for probably the better part of your lifetimes to be wary of allegory, right? Um, but if we are going to read medieval literature, we need to get over that, right? Yes, when you see a fire-breathing serpent, especially one emerging from a tomb, right? So we associated with death and, 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 and thinking about, like we're, we're thinking about sort of afterlife issues, right? And there's a dragon. Yes, we should be thinking about Satan. We should be thinking about the devil. The dragon is the symbol of Satan. Um, uh, very clearly laid out iconography, iconographically in the New Testament. So when you get uh, a knight, and when he's called a serpent... Uh, Morgan, exactly as you say, then we should be thinking, we're thinking not only of the dragon of Revelation, we're also thinking about the serpent of Eden, right, in Genesis. So we're, we're doing the entire, like, satanic bookends of the entire story uh, when we're talking about the serpent and the dragon. Um, so, so, yeah, absolutely, we should not be uh, really kind of resisting that. Um, anyway, okay, so... Um, we're opening tombs, we're slaying dragons. I'm coming back. Uh, Stephen, who, was it you who was saying that Lan or not Lancelot, um, Mallory doesn't seem enormously engaged by this little segment here? And I think you're right. Um, I think he's not completely... Um, I think Mallory seems to be not yet fully engaged allegorically, right? Um, he's working up to it. <laughs> this is really... This is kind of like warm-up stretching exercises, right? Lancelot and the Dragon is to the quest for the Holy Grail what, you know, I... Uh, like quad and calf stretches are to the marathon run, right? I mean, he's just he's just limbering up here, allegorically. Um, and Stephen, yes, it contextualizes the lion too, especially a prophesied lion who is to come, right? There is coming one who will be like a lion, not of the tribe of Judah. He's a, a different lion, but yet a lion will come. Um, uh, yeah, no, uh huh. Yes, you're thinking in the right direction there. Um, now, Michelle, you are also right that we have had a dragon associated, of course, with Arthur, and uh, um, there's the whole pen dragon thing. Um, so that is, if you think about this as a political allegory, it's deeply awkward, right? Um, 
and foreshadows the destruction of the court there at the end. Um, so, um, yep, yep, that's uh, that's awkward there. Um, I can't help but feel that somebody who is more enthusiastic about allegory would make a heck of a lot more out of this scene. Um, and he'll get there. Well, or rather, he will submit himself more to it uh, as we go through his my personal reading. That's totally crit fake, and I can't prove it. Um, but um, uh, just brace yourself. Lots of allegory to come. So consider this a warm-up exercise here, too. If it's a political allegory, Michelle, it's a bad sign. If it's a spiritual allegory, it's a good sign. Right here, he's vanquishing the devil, which can't be associated with anything good. That is, the devil can't be associated with anything good. Uh, uh, so, and that's probably a good thing. And it's associated by the writing on the tomb. His slaying of the serpent is associated with the writing on the tomb, of with the engendering of the lion. Right, who shall pass all other nights? Um, so that l would seem to link the two things, the vanquishing of evil with the conception of Galahad, and so therefore associates Galahad with virtue and the uh, overcoming of evil in some kind of fairly definitive way from the beginning, right? Uh, Patricia wants to know, can it be both kinds of allegory at once? Oh, you can do that, and really, really good allegorists do that really, really well. Spencer, for instance, Edmund Spencer, uh, absolutely can pull that off. Uh, he can run allegory on three or four different levels at the same time. Uh, so can Dante. But, um, though their allegorical proclivities are rather different. Um, but, anyway. Um, I... It works here. Right? And I, I mean, I like the fact, Patricia, that the way that, I mean, if we do think about both of them at the same time, it makes this scene deeply and even disturbingly ambiguous, right? Or sort of ambivalent, really. Um, it is simultaneously both a really good and a really bad thing. But I'm not sure that's inappropriate, actually, right? Um, I think that the ambivalence of it really kind of works uh, in the sense that who Lancelot is and what Lancelot's doing He's kind of a both of, at once kind of individual, right? Is he good? Yeah. No, he's legitimately good, right? Slaying the dragon. Absolutely. Standing up for virtue. Um, but also, you know, leading to the downfall of the Arthurian court. Yep, absolutely. So, you know, I think it, um, I think that works. Um, yeah, good. Okay. Let's keep going. Woo. All right. So um, after he slays the dragon, the Holy Grail shows up. Were you surprised? Were you surprised when the Holy Grail just kind of wanders through the scene? Right? And therewithal come King Peles, the good and noble king, who is Elaine's dad, of course, and saluted Sir Launcelot and he him again. Now, fire knicked, sighed the king. What is your name? I require you of your knickthood, tell ye me. Sir, sighed Sir Launcelot. Wit you well, my nam is Sir Launcelot du Lac, and my nam is King Pelles, king of the foreign country, and cousin nigh unto Joseph of Arimathy. And than either of them mad much of other, and so they went into the castle to talk their repast, and anon there come in a dove at a window, and in her mouth there seemed a little censer of gold, and therewithal there was such a savour as all the spicery of the world had been there. And forthwithal, there was upon the table all manner of meats and drinkes that they could think upon. So there came in a damsel, passing fire and young, and she bare a vessel of gold betwixt her hondes, and thereto the king knelled devoutly, and said his prayers, and so did all that were there. Ah, Jesu, said Sir Launcelot, what may this mean? Sir, sighed the king, this is the richest thing that any man hath living, and what this thing goeth, and one that, I think, this thing goeth abroad, the round table shall be broken for a season. And with you well, sighed the king, this is the holy sancreal, 
that ye have here seen. Okay. Um, all right. So. Several things. Um, <laughs> Stephen is saying, given that we have uh, somebody who's a, a, a nigh cousin unto Joseph of Arimathea, uh, Joseph of Arimathea, are we sure that the lion is not, in fact, coming out of the tribe of Judah? Yeah, no, no, I wouldn't say sure exactly. I mean, he's not that lion of the tribe of Judah. He's not literally Jesus. Um, but, you know, distant cousin, right? Got it linked, linked back by blood. Uh, the blood, that's important, right? Uh, not by blood uh, in, in that sense, but by blood in a different... Anyway, the blood is important, of course, as we know and as we'll see. Um, anyway, so... First of all, one side note, and I won't, I won't get into this because I don't want to spin off into talking about a completely different book. Um, but for all of you who in this scene and other scenes like it were remembering the island of Ramandu at the end of the voyage of the Dawn Treader, you should be. <laughs> I'll just leave it at that. Uh, if parts of this sounded hauntingly familiar and you were thinking about Ramandu and his daughter and the birds from the sun and the and Aslan's table and everything, th there is much reason for you to have been thinking about that. Um, but anyway, yeah, so James and Nancy, you are both correct that two of the things that we get associated very persistently with the sun grail are A, aroma. You can identify the grail by smell. Uh, that remarkable scent of uh, as if all of the spicery of the world was there, right? So um, the, the, the wonderful, kind of indescribable, uh, unparalleled by any sort of single earthly, I mean, it doesn't smell like a particular thing, right? Um, but it smells like the greatest and best combination of all of the good things, um, but also rare, exotic. Uh, it doesn't, it's not a homey smell, right? The Holy Grail doesn't smell like apple pie, right? It doesn't smell like cinnamon rolls. It doesn't smell like, you know, fresh cut grass. Whatever it is your favorite, you know, uh, comfort, comfort smell is, it doesn't smell like that, right? It smells like something exotic, something foreign, something different, something outside your normal experience, but really, really good and really, really precious, really, really valuable. Um, it may, in fact... Matthew Hershen wrote her smell like elves. You, we can't rule that out. <laughs> Absolutely not. So first, the smell, right? Um, the, um, uh, the second thing is food, right? As uh, uh, James Stephen was pointing out, he's surprised the Holy Grail always comes with a full buffet. It absolutely always comes with a full buffet. Um, that the... Grail provides all manner of meat is and drink is that they could think upon. It's not just food. It's not just a feast. It is the most bounteous of feasts. It is the uh, and everybody finds whatever they most like, right? It's um uh Oh, uh, Gerald, when it says no bread, well, I don't know that it, it that. Remember, the word meat is often used generically, like you go to meat, which doesn't mean you only eat meat. Um, you probably eat bread, too. But um, just, you know, meat was what, like, you knew you were having a meal when you were eating meat, right? Uh, again, at least if you're, you know, uh, rich. So. Um, when it says all manner of meats and drinks, I don't think that that just necessarily means like the anti-vegetarian smorgasbord here. Um, uh, but but I mean, certainly there would literally be meats. I don't doubt. Um, but um, yeah, yeah. Um, so when St Stephen says providing food and drink, should we be thinking of the bread of life and living water? Yes, we should. I do think. Um, but notice how that is. Um, and, and Stephen, I think, especially thinking about the bread of life, um, thinking about it in the context of 
if you want a biblical sort of hook for that, right, um, the, um, the hook would be the Gospel of John, chapter 6, after the feeding of the 5,000, right? And then when, like, the people come following Jesus after the miraculous feeding in the wilderness, and he's like, y'all are just looking for food, right? And he's like, I'm giving you something more than food. And what is the something more than food? It's his flesh. It's when he, he like, says, uh, you know, he who does not eat my flesh and drink my blood, right? You know, uh, it's like, you have to eat my flesh and drink my blood. And the people are all like, that's really super gross. Uh, and, and anyway, um, that's the passage, right? So we have... The bounty of food, right? People taking the bounty of food in a purely uh, sort of physical way. Him accusing them of focusing on just the physical needs. Um, and him drawing attention to the fact that the food, the bountiful physical food that he supplied is designed to be sort of like a, a metaphor, right? Of the spiritual sustenance that he will supply through his flesh and his blood. Not can't, literally cannibalistically as the crowd there obviously thinks um, uh, which is why they're kind of briefly grossed out um, but anyway those associations there yeah so that's that is the kind of the the direction of this here right um, the great feast that is laid out is like a, a symbol except it's literally true like it's 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 like an enacted allegory of the richness and fullness of the sustenance that is available in the flesh and blood of Christ, which is associated with the Sancreal, right? The, uh, the sacrifice of Christ. So, yes, it's associated with the buffet, um, which is, as I say, like an enacted allegory, right? Um, uh, okay. Is the dove the Holy Spirit? Not necessarily literally the Holy Spirit. If you're thinking of the Holy Spirit, you should be. Absolutely, you should be. Um, especially since what the dove is holding in her mouth is a little censer of gold. Um, uh, censer, of course, means the thing that you put incense in, right? So, like ball thing on a chain with incense coming out of it, right? So, um, th and that's where the smell is coming from, presumably. You may remember that, uh, again, if, you're, if, you, if you know your Bible, you may remember the imagery in the beginning of the book of Revelation that describes the incense, um, uh, parallels the incense with the prayers of the saints uh, uh, going up to heaven. So uh, we have the association between the Holy Spirit and prayer, there's lots of things. Um, there's lots of things going on there with the dove and the censer. Um, and then and that's when we get the savor, right? It's it's it is the it is the the uh, the burning incense in the censer hanging from the beak of the dove, uh, which is uh, brings about the savor as of all the spicery in the world. Um, and yes, Matthew, the dove should also make you think of Noah's Ark as well. Absolutely, yes. Um, so associated also, therefore, with deliverance, right? With the sign of hope, the sign of deliverance, right? Uh, the promise of God's deliverance. Yep, absolutely. This works all, all those things uh, work their way through. If you don't know the Bible very well and your head is spinning with all the Bible stuff I'm doing here, Buckle up, because we're going to be doing a lot of this for the next few weeks. Uh, the Holy Grail stuff is very Bible intense, uh, and I, 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 I can't apologize for that. Um, I'll try not to be too elliptical when I talk about it. I'll try to explain. as but, And if you're not following, please tell me. Right, feel free to admit that it's okay, um, and I, I don't want to start like speaking in code or something like that. Um, but it, it is uh, we're, it is not an avoidable thing when we get to the Holy Grail here. Um, anyway, okay. Um, so Devora, yeah, the thing he says about the round table being broken for a time. Um, yeah, uh, this is the richest thing that any man hath living. And what this thing, 
uh, and when that this thing goeth abroad, the round table shall be broken for a season. Um, he's just, again, talking about, because everybody here knows the future, he's talking about what's going to happen in the quest for the Holy Grail, when all the knights of Arthur's court are going to set out on the quest for the Holy Grail, and, you know, the round table will be, you know, nobody will be around because everyone's off questing for the Holy Grail. Um, but, of course, that breaking in the sense of everybody breaking up and going their own ways uh, on the quest for the Sun Grail is... Um, uh, of course, only the foreshadowing and both the first steps and also the foreshadowing of, of the larger and permanent breaking of the round table that will be coming after that. Um, notice what's going to happen. Again, it's not about the finding, right, of the Holy Grail. When this thing goeth abroad. So, the time is coming soon when the Holy Grail, when the Sank Real is going to start wandering about. Right? How? Why? We don't know, but it's going to... Right now it hangs out here, right? King Pelles has it, right? It lives with King Pelles. Why? Because he's Joseph of Arimathea's cousin, man. That's why, right? Don't ask questions. So um, uh, anyway, yeah, so there it is, and it's here, but it's going to wander. It's going gonna, it's, it's gonna to go abroad, and then when it does, things are going to change. So Devorah, it doesn't mean that the grail will be lost exactly. It means that the Grail is going to like come to Logris, right? It's going to come uh, to England, um, sort of. It's complicated. We'll get there, right? But but it's interesting that he talks about it that way, about it's going abroad. Um, uh, yeah, um, yeah. So okay. Yeah, no, I'm good. Let's just leave it with that. I don't want to get too far ahead of ourselves. We'll have plenty of time looking at the Holy Grail later on. Okay. The Vessel of Gold, by the way, what does it look like? Not only is it not clear that Indiana Jones has it exactly right what the cup should look like, it's not even a cup. Or at least it's not obvious that it's a cup. In fact, when... Uh, it's not obvious what a grail is. Um, in a lot of the traditions, a grail is a platter, not a cup at all. Uh, so it's just, it's a vessel. Is it a bowl? Is it a cup? Is it a plate? Um, we don't really know, but it doesn't particularly matter. That's certainly not the point. Um, yeah, Devor, that's really interesting. Uh, Devor says they're not really thinking about the Grail as an in, as an inanimate object. No, I mean it is kind of, but um, uh, but yes, I agree with you. They're speaking about it as if it isn't. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> Morgan asks, is it a huge dove or a tiny sensor? Ah. Uh, I think it's a tiny sensor. Um, but that word seem it is interesting, isn't it, Morgan? Um, I think it's a tiny sensor and a normal sized or vaguely normal sized dove, but I'm not 100% sure. Um, Gerald asks Does it mean the fall of Arthur's kingdom is also divinely ordained? Sort of. Um, but of course, it's foreseen. Right? But that doesn't necessarily mean that the fall of it is blessed by God. Right? Um, in a sense, of course, it's ordained, certainly, in the sense that, like, everything rises and falls, right? The, the turning of the wheel of fortune is ordained, uh, right? And so, therefore, the fall of Arthur, the eventual fall of Arthur's court is, in, is inevitable, right? Um, is God putting a particular curse upon Arthur's kingdom? No, I don't see any reason to think that. Um, uh, and there's some reason to think the contrary, really, but anyway. Yeah, so James, good. Thank you for bringing me back to that. Um, and Marilyn wants to know about this, too. What's up with the foreign country thing, right? I mean, of all the um, introductions, right? Um, Hi, my name is King Pelles, king of the foreign country. Like, who introduces themselves that way? And it does lead to the question of what 
does that even mean? In what sense is this? A, is this more foreign than other countries are? Is there something stranger? Is there something fairy-like that is capital F fairy-like about this place? To which my answer is definitely yes. There is something fairy-like. Is it fairy itself? Are, 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 are we, you know, no, I'm not saying that it's claiming that this is fairy, but I'm saying it's kind of like fairy, definitely. Um, uh, yeah. Um, uh, Oh yeah, no. Again, sensor. Uh, a sensor is just uh, it's the what you put the incense in, right? So when you and you, it's it's a thing, a you know cage thing, right? A, a vessel with holes in it, right? Which is usually hanging from a chain, so it can be swung from side to side, um, uh, so that you can. <laughs> it's one of my favorite inadvertent puns. Uh, you know the um, uh, the thurifer is the name of the person in the liturgy. You know, in a, in a liturgical environment, who comes down and waves the censer from side to side, right, and wafts the incense over the people. Um, which the verb for which is incensing. Right, he's incensing the people, not like incensing them to riot, but he's 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 incensing them. And I always. Um, uh, I am still sometimes want to giggle when I hear people talk about incensing the congregation. <laughs> but sorry, that's kind of, I guess, just proves that I'm raised Protestant, but whatever. Um, anyhow, uh, yeah, and, and yes, C E N S E R is the modern spelling, Gerald. That's absolutely right. Um, okay, so. Joseph of Arimathea, remember, chronology. Just don't, don't, don't worry. Don't, it's, it, it doesn't matter. Just, yeah, chronology. It doesn't matter. Um, so, um, all right. I think we're good. We'll have lots of time to talk about the Sancreal and everything associated with it here. Um, oh, wait, foreign country. I didn't finish that. It is interesting that not only, remember, not only does he introduce himself as that, it's on the tombstone for crying out loud. You know, shall engender a lion in this foreign country, right? Who says that? Like, the people in the country don't call it a foreign country, <laughs> right? So was it somebody from England who came, like Merlin maybe, who came and carved this? Well, there are letters of gold, so that pretty much has Merlin written all over it, right? Uh, but anyway, I mean, everybody calls this the foreign country. It, it um, uh, leads one to think that this country, as I said before, is more foreign than your average international location, right? Um, this is a place that's set apart. Uh, you know, as, as, you know, the Holy Grail lives here, right? Uh, the king of this place is closely related to Joseph of Arimathea. Uh, this, is, this is a different place. When you come into this country, you have crossed it seems a different kind of boundary. That's why I say it's kind of like fairy. It isn't exactly fairy, but it is kind of like fairy. Um, yeah, I, Tim, I don't know if I go quite as far as saying strange as in not of this world, but it's got that kind of atmosphere, right? Um, certainly not a normal functioning part of this world. So, uh, at the very least, a land that is set aside, Right. It's not just a separate political jurisdiction. Right. This is a uh, a different kind of country. Um, and King Pellis would seem to be a different kind of king. Um, <laughs> James Stephen says, are they in Wales? <laughs> Even more foreign, James, than that. <laughs> yes. Um, yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. Uh, 
I was going to talk about Kratian again, but I won't. Okay. So the king and Sir Launcelot lad their life the most party of that die together, together. And fine old King Pelles have found the mean that Sir Launcelot should have lie by his doctor, Fire Elaine. And for this intent, the king knew well that Sir Launcelot should get a pusel on his doctor, which should be called Sir Galahad, the good knight by whom all the foreign country should be brought out of danger, and by him the holy grail should be enchieved. Than come forth a laddie that heeked dam brusen, and she sighed unto the king, Sir, wit you well, Sir Launcelot loveth no laddie in the world, but all only Queen Guinevere. And therefore work ye by my counsel, and I shall mock him to lie with your doctor, and he shall not wit but that he lieth by Queen Guinevere. Ah, fire laddie, sighed the king, hope ye that ye may bring this matter about? Sir, she said, upon pine of my life, let me deal. For this damn Brusen was one of the greatest enchanters that was that time in the world. She, uh, she uh, majored in nigromancy. Uh, we, I mean, obviously we know where she went to school. Um, Stephen, the king, not only doesn't have a problem with his daughter having a child out of wedlock. She, he not only has no problem with his daughter having a child out of wedlock by means of deception, he doesn't have a problem with his daughter having a child out of wedlock by means of deception, by means of sorcery. Right? Yeah. No, we're fine with that. Um, that is uh, perfectly fine in this particular foreign country. Yeah. Katriana, that's exactly right. Um, this country is, we're not in Kansas anymore, foreign. Yes, yes, it is foreign exactly like that. Um, so, yeah. <laughs> Karina, I totally agree. Let me deal is on Dame Brucen's business cards. Yes, yes. Dame Brucen, enchanter, let me deal. Yeah, that's exactly, that's her business slogan. No question. Um, okay. So, Marie, what is this? Like, it's in danger somehow? What is the danger that is confronting the foreign country? And how should... So Lancelot needs to sleep with Elaine so that Elaine can conceive Galahad because Galahad is going to be the one by whom all the foreign country should be brought out of danger. And by him the Holy Grail should be achieved. Those two things might perhaps be noticed the verb, achieved, right? He's going to achieve the Grail. He's not going to find it. He's going to achieve it. And bring the whole foreign country out of danger, possibly by related, you know, related to the fact that he's going to achieve the Holy Grail. Um, so, ooh, Devora, remind me to come back to your question. I'm going to talk about that in a minute. Okay. Um, so... All right. No. <laughs> I don't even know where to start here. It seems strange. Here's my problem. I don't know how strange this is supposed to be. This is one of those moments where I, I distrust, on the one hand, I distrust the modern response, right? Um, if we are thinking about King Peles here, and our first thought is King Peles, father of the year, right? That is, if we are evaluating King Peles by modern parenting standards, that's, I think, clearly inappropriate, right? I don't think that's a... Um, a fair response to the text. I mean, it's taking it, to, you know, placing it in a completely modern context. So it makes me uncomfortable, right? I get twitchy. I, I mean, I'm not saying I don't feel that reaction myself. I'm just saying it's a response to which even in myself makes me twitchy. However, on the other hand, I am less confident. I'm not sure whether or not we're supposed to 
be uncomfortable by this. Like, to what extent would Mallory's contemporary audience have been creeped out by King Pele's? I don't know the answer to that question. There are sometimes some things that we have seen earlier in the text, and we've talked about some of these things before, where I've argued this is something that we really... Do. So I, let me give an example. Sir Tor, right? Remember King Pelinor and the uh, the the cowherd's wife and the dog and the bastard son and the yeah, that whole scene, right? The whole like, yeah, oh sure, right? I raped his mom in the field that one day, and she got married, and then like had a bunch of other kids and everything, and he's not really your kid, he's my kid, and and right, and then I took her dog to remember me by, and all that kind of thing. Like, that was one where I was arguing, although it is deeply uncomfortable from a modern point of view, I do not get the impression that I don't see the cues in the text for us to feel outraged by that. I think that the out, any outrage that we feel from that seems to me to be a completely modern outrage. And I get the impression that we're supposed to be sort of nodding along with that and all kind of clapping King Pelinor in the back and sort of understanding that that's how it works. I don't, I don't see any real censure of King Pelinor in the text there, even though again, from a modern perspective, that whole scene is really kind of horrifying and deeply uncomfortable as we discussed before uh, here. I'm less sure. Right. Um, again, we like from a modern perspective, we look at this and we're and fine old King Pellas have found the means. And boy, he was really eager to find some means by which he could throw Sir Lancelot into bed with his daughter. Right. He really was looking to pimp his daughter out to his guest uh, by any means that he possibly could. That is so uncomfortable from a modern point of view. But I am less confident that it is not also weird to the medievals, right? Um, for a, And there are two reasons for this. Reason number one. Um, reason number one is that this sort of... Fathers acting this way towards their daughters would not have been normal in the Middle Ages. I don't think that's normal. Now we've seen it before. We saw it in the in the 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 story of Sir Gareth. Remember when his host like ordered his daughter to go to Sir Gareth's bed, right? In that whole Princess in the Pea, uh, um, issue, right? Um, but uh, anyway, um. James points out this is very much like how Arthur was conceived yeah, with the, the sorcery and the, the yes, it is. Um, it's gender reversed, right? Um, which is interesting. Uh, you know, the Uther story is a story in which masculine desire is enabled by deception, right? Um, so that she would take him into her bed. Um, but there again, it was, it was the overcoming of f a feminine virtue, explicitly virtue. Remember, she was a virtuous wife, we were told at the beginning. Um, Igraine, that is, right, to the Duke of Cornwall. Um, so oh, in order to overcome the virtue of the wife, um, the legitimate and moral resistance of the woman, right, um, he, he, you know, he, he gets around this by deception. Here, we have a similar situation, gender reversed. It is Lancelot's virtue now, right? His sexual virtue that needs to be overcome and is going to be overcome by deception again. So I agree that it's, it's deeply parallel, though intriguingly um, mirror reversed. Um, and yes, uh, Karita, it is a little bit like Jacob and Leah as well. Um, certainly like Jacob and Leah in that apparently, uh, uh, just as in Genesis, nobody can tell the difference between one woman and another in the dark. Um, uh, but anyway, um, 
Brian points out that our modern concern would be about Elaine as a woman being denied the freedom to choose here. Um, and that perhaps would not have concerned a medieval audience as much as the moral problem of adultery. I agree. I don't think that the medievals would have nearly so much of the concern. You're absolutely right that that would be different. Now, of course, one thing that we find is that there is absolutely no one more consenting to this whole situation than Elaine, right? Elaine is all about this and very consistently all about this. Um, uh, so that modern concern, which again certainly seems to be in play here, would seem not to be so much of an issue later on. But nevertheless, um, I don't know, the whole situation is um, weird and awkward. And I come back to the foreign country thing, right? This is... This is weird. In part, so there's a good cause for all of this, right? Just in case anybody, medieval or modern, is uncomfortable about this situation, remember that it's all in a good cause, right? We've got to get Galahad born. And remember, it's not just because Galahad is important for him to be in general because somebody needs to sit in the Siege Perilous. No, there's like humanitarian reasons why we need Galahad, right? Because the entire foreign country is apparently in danger from which Galahad is going to deliver it. We don't know what the danger is and we don't know how he's going to deliver it, but that's not important right now. What's important is that great good is going to come from Sir Galahad's entering into the world and that needs to happen one way or another. And so therefore it's fine. The ends kind of justify the means, right? Okay. Um, is that uncomfortable? Yeah, it's uncomfortable. It was uncomfortable with a grain. It's uncomfortable here. Um, and, um, yeah, yeah. Um, and Karita, I agree where the parallel with Arthur's conception breaks down is that the fidelity that is overcome for Lancelot is an illegitimate fidelity. Right. Uh, where Zagrain was being faithful to her, like, legal husband. <laughs> right. Um, I, I think, in my mind, though, the direct, the even more direct parallel, I mean, we do get that, uh, that same kind of situation where he's faithful to Guinevere except uh, uh, under deception. But he's also, there is also a perfectly legitimate moral ground that Lancelot has which he is being deceived out of too and that is like his chastity in general right his uh, uh, conviction not to love anybody paramours um, but anyway okay um, yeah Brian says it's unclear in this story whether the deception to get a Lancelot and Elaine together is just a plot device that we aren't supposed to be bothered by or something more sinister or at least something more weird, Brian. I would, I would go to, and again, I come back to the foreignness of the country, right? Um, things are just different over there, um, and uh, it's a little, it's a little, it's a little strange. Um, uh, and Nancy, I agree. I do think modern people might be concerned with taking away Lancelot's power to make a choice. I mean, there is a sense in which Lancelot is being raped here. There, there is, there is a rape parallel. And of course, remember, we've been focused on that for a long time, right? Uh, the rape of men by women, especially the attempted rape of Lancelot by lots and lots of women, has been a thing that we've been looking at uh, on many occasions throughout this book, right? Um, so one sense, one thing that's happening here, Nancy, is someone is finally going to succeed, right? Of all of the women who have thrown themselves at Lancelot, tried to pressure... Um, uh, uh, pressure, extort, bribe, uh, deceive, seduce, um, compel Lancelot to have sex with them. Um, uh, we're, we're fi this, this one is finally going to succeed. Dame Brucen closes the deal, right? She makes it happen. Um, and therefore, this is a really significant moment. Again, a, a, a really important culmination. Lancelot, who has successfully defended his virtue all the way through, is finally going to fail. Right? Again, another thing which for me leads me to my A reading of this text that says he is not sleeping with 
Guinevere yet. Because if he is, all of that's window dressing. And it doesn't really matter so much. He might as well be sleeping with at least one of those other damsels who are all throwing themselves at him. Um, uh, and, you know, it's all it's all pointless if he's been sleeping with Guinevere the whole time. Um, okay. Uh, oh, Devora, your question before. There's a really interesting word in that first paragraph, which I think is really fascinating. And it's... Um, to use another Bible reference, this word is like uh, a cloud the size of a man's hand on the horizon, okay? There's much more of this to come. Pusel. The king knew well that Sir Launcelot should get a pusel upon his doctor. Pusel literally means virgin, okay? That word means virgin. So if someone says, but I'm a pusel, that means I'm a virgin, Okay. That's a weird construction. He's going to get a virgin upon his daughter. Y yes. Yes, when the baby is born, it will be a virgin. That's not unusual, really, at all, right? Um, uh, yeah, I... Um, so, I, and Nancy, I, I get exactly how weird that sounds. Um, like, talk about your non-descriptive uh, adjectives to use of newborn infants, right? Um, here's why I think this is important. Brace yourself. Virginity is going to be a very big deal. Throughout the quest for the Holy Grail, we're going to be talking about virginity a lot, okay? Here is one principle that hope perhaps might... It's suggested, I think, pretty strongly by this very peculiar-sounding usage here. Um, and I hope that this will help all the rest of the, virgins, the virginity stuff that's coming up to make a little bit more sense. In the modern world, we tend to talk about virginity as if it were simply the act of not having had sex yet. It's a negative state, right? If you are a virgin, that means there is something you have not yet done, right? It's an absence. It's a, a waiting period. It's a, it's, a, it's, a, it's a negative thing. The medieval, of con, the medieval conception of virginity is not a negative thing. It's a positive thing. A virgin is not someone who just has not yet had sex, who is ignorant of a particular experience. A virgin is someone who has something. Virginity is a positive thing, okay? Um, and this is, and we still, notice we still retain in the way that we use, in as much as we talk about this at all anymore, which is much, much less often than it used to be, the phrase that we still use, we still talk about people losing their virginity as if they had something which they lose when they have sex, right? That is a recollection of the old conception. Again, most of the time when we talk about virginity in the modern world, we talk about like when you lose your virginity, you are gaining something, right? You are gaining experience. You are, you are, you are acquiring something that, again, it's, virginity is a negative state in which you don't have something and you get it when you have sex for the first time. In the medieval world, it is exactly the opposite. Virginity is a positive thing that you have and it is lost when you have sex. It is taken from if you are a, 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 a virgin who is who is raped or who is being forced. It is being take for, taken. It is being ripped away from you by force. It is a terrible, terrible thing in itself. Um, so, yes, the baby is going to be a virgin in the modern sense. In the fact that, like, newsflash: the newborn infant has not had sex with anybody yet. But this baby is going to be a pusil in a positive sense. Everybody is, again, in the Middle Ages. But this one is going to be the... That positive thing, the, which is a powerful thing, by the way. Um, uh, 
Uh, some of you may remember Milton's famous phrase uh, in his uh, in his play Comus when he when he refers to the sun-clad power of virginity. That's the thing, right? Um, this particular pusel, right? This particular baby that is coming into the world uh, is going to have um, the sun-clad power of virginity in spades. Right, he's going to be a pusel in a special sense. Um, so, anyway, but th but it is a very very conspicuous word usage there. Um, yeah, don't th no 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 Stephen and James, um, don't don't um, don't think about innocence. Innocence is hard. Because again, see, innocence is something that you lose, but innocence is not something we value in the modern world. Does anyone value innocence, right? Very, I mean, some people who have experience in retrospect value innocence and wish they could regain their innocence of some of the things, of some of the innocence that they've lost. But in general, we tend to talk about innocence as if it's, I mean, it's associated with ignorance, right? Which is usually bad. Um, again, Innocence, too, we tend to speak of in a negative sense, as if if you are an innocent, that means you haven't experienced stuff. You don't know about stuff. Um, like virginity, innocence was a positive thing that you had. And if you lose your innocence, that's a bad thing in general. Anyway, um, Nancy blames William Blake. I agree. I'm willing to blame Blake on that one, too. Uh, sort of. I don't know. Uh, you know. I am not sure. It might be Blake's fault indirectly. I'm not sure that the songs of innocence and experience do not, in fact, retain a memory of innocence in this older sense. But, anyway, whatever. Um, uh, okay. Um, Okay. Oh, so uh, Marie, great question. Marie says, does chastity in some way replace this positive thing after marriage? No. No, it's a different thing. So, okay, so chastity. Chastity and virginity are not the same thing. Again, we often use those two where in as much as we use either of those words, we often use them synonymously or think other people are using them. So they are not synonyms, right? Chastity is sexual virtue. It is not the same thing as abstaining from sex. Uh, if you are married, abstinence is not a virtue, right? A chaste wife is a sexually active wife, okay? Uh, a, a, an unmarried person, male or female, is, uh, is chaste only if they are not sexually active, right? So uh, certainly in unmarried people, there is a 100% correlation uh, between chastity and virginity, right? But they are not the same thing. Um, chastity is a lifelong virtue that anyone, the married and the unmarried, can practice equally. Virginity is unique, of course, uh, to that thing. So it's, does it in some way replace it in some sense? Yes, but it's not the same thing. It's not the same thing. And Marie, this is why throughout the Middle Ages, unashamedly, there is no... This is one of the things. There are a number of things on the list of ways in which modern Christianity of various different kinds differs from medieval Christianity. One of the most kind of startling differences is the status of marriage. Of course, the status of marriage changes a lot once Protestantism comes around, but still. Um, In the Middle Ages, virgins are on a completely different spiritual level than married people, right? There is a little bit of justification for this uh, from the Apostle Paul, right, in 1 Corinthians chapter 7. It's not much, but it's kind of there, and the emphasis that they place on it in the Middle Ages goes way past anything justified by that text. But anyway, yeah, there's, um, 
I, if you're tempted to say something like, would, would, would that mean that someone who's like married and, and has sex within marriage and is still chased throughout their lives is like a, a sort of a second class spiritual citizen to a virgin? Yep. Uh-huh. That's just how it was in the Middle Ages. Absolutely. Um, they would they would never have had any problems about that. Um, uh, yeah. Yeah. Mm hmm. Second class spiritual citizens get used to it. All right. Anyway. Whew. All right. Boy. Am I not moving very fast? OK. So Lancelot has been ensorcelled, right? And he's he receives a summons from Guinevere. Guinevere, he gets a message saying, Hi, this is from Guinevere. I'm like five miles away. You want to come over? And he's like, yeah. So he goes over and he says, Where is my lady? Said Sir Lancelot. In the castle of Cass, sighed the messenger. But five mile hence. Then thought Sir Lancelot to be there, the Sam, Kni the Sam Nicht, and found this damn Brusen. By the commandment of King Pelles, she let send a line to this castle with five and twenty knictes unto the castle of Cass. Than Sir Launcelot against nicht rode unto the castle, and there anon he was received worshipfully with such people to his seeming as were about Queen Guinevere's secret. So when Sir Launcelot was a licht, he asked where the queen was. So Dam Brusen sighed she was in her bed. And than people were avoided, and Sir Launcelot was lad under her chamber, and than Dambrusen brought Sir Launcelot a cup of wine, and anon as he had drunken that wine, he was so assotted and mad that he meeked mock no delay, but without any let he went to bed. And so he went that Maiden Alain had been so he went, that is he believed, he thought, that Maiden Alain had been Queen Guinevere. And wit you well that Sir Launcelot was glad, and so was the Lady Elaine that he had gotten Sir Launcelot. She had gotten Sir Launcelot in her armes, for well she knew that that Sam Nicht should be begotten Sir Galahad upon her, should, that should prove the best knicht of the world. Okay. Um, all right, all right. Um... Okay. Notice, even here in this passage, I think it seems to me we have a, 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 a sort of conflict between a Lancelot who casually will hop into Guinevere's bed and a Lancelot who has to be pushed with sorcery into Guinevere's, even, in, even into the bed of Guinevere, right? Because notice there are two different elements of the ensorceling that is being performed by Dame Brucen here, right? Um, and that is first the deception of his of, of appearances, right? The people, you know, Lancelot takes the people there for Guinevere's attendance, right? Um, so he believes that he has evidence that it's really her here, right? So he's deceived. If Lancelot and Guinevere had been having sex for years, that should be enough, right? All you need is that plus a dark room, right? Bob's your uncle, right? That's why he's going to hop into bed with her and he's going to think she's Guinevere and everything's fine. But Dame Bruzen doesn't leave it at that, right? He's like, hey, where's Guinevere? I'm here to hang out with Guinevere. And, and they're like, oh, she's in bed. And he's like, okay. So Dame Bruzen sighed she was in her bed. And so he was led to her chamber. And then he's given wine, which makes him assotted and mad. It's only after he is assotted by the wine, which seems to be not merely alcoholically intoxicating, right? There seems to be some, uh, some, some sorcery going on here with the wine. Remember the drink that Tristram and Isolde had, right? And we have now. Uh, remember how he said we had all those parallels and it was setting things up? And we're, yeah, we're getting some of that here, right? So we got... A love drink, right? That he seems to be drinking, and when he drinks it, his Lancelot's inhibitions are completely hosed at this point, right? Uh, and he immediately, and 
he make mark no delay, but without any let, he went to bed. So he goes straight to bed and he does not pass go on the way to bed. Marie, we are led to believe that it is the wine that leads him straight into her bed. Again, I, you can see it. It's, it see what I mean? By, it looks like it kind of goes in both directions here. And how I was saying at the beginning, I don't find either reading totally satisfying. Um, if this is the first time, if in this moment when he is, uh, when he drinks this love drink and hops into the bed that he believes to be Guinevere's, why isn't he more upset about that? Why isn't that more of a big deal to him later on, right? When he wakes up, he's only going to be upset about the fact that it isn't Guinevere, right? Um, and yet, if they were hopping into each other's beds under normal circumstances, why does he need, why Why do we need the wine, right? Um, anyway, as I was saying before. Okay. Um, let's keep going. Let's accelerate. And so they lie to get her until undern of the morn, and all the windows and hollows of that chamber were stopped, so that that no manner of die meeked be sign. And anon Sir Launcelot remembered him, and arose, and went to the window, and anon as he had unshut the window, the enchantment was past. Then he knew himself that he had done amiss. Alas, he sighed, that I have lived so long, for now I am I shamed. Now, if that had happened before he noticed that it, that it wasn't Guinevere, I'd actually be kind of happy, right? Because that sounds like what Lancelot might say if he had been ensorcelled and slept with Guinevere, we believe that he slept with Guinevere, and then he wakes up in the morning and he says, oh, alas, that I have lived so long, for now I am shamed. Right now, Guinevere and I don't love each other sinless anymore. Right? Uh, it's now we've crossed that particular Rubicon and now we're in big trouble. Right? Um, and I am shamed. Except that doesn't seem to be the case. Right? He seems to be shamed not because of sleeping with Guinevere or believing that he has, but because it's Elaine, because he's cheated on Guinevere. And anon he got his sweared in his hand and sighed, Thou traitorous, what art thou that I have lain by all of this knick, all this, I keep adding a kn at the beginning of that because I'm so used to saying that word, all this nicht, thou shalt die, reeked here of mine hondes. Then this fire laddie a line skipped out of her bed all naked and knailed doon afore Launcelot and sighed. Fire curtes knicked Sir Launcelot, knelling before him. Yeah, we got that. Naked, right? Yes. Okay, yeah, we got that. Ye are common of king's blood, and therefore I require you have mercy upon me. And as thou art renowned the most noble knicked of the world, slay me not, for I have in my womb begotten of thee that shall be the most noblest knicked of the world. Ah, false traitorous, why hast thou betrayed me? Tell me anon, said Sir Launcelot, what thou art. Sir, she sighed, I am Elaine, the doctor of King Pelles. Well, said Sir Launcelot, I will forgive you. And therewith he took her up in his armis and kissed her, for she was a fire laddie, and thereto lusty and young, and wise as any was that time living. And thereto lusty and young, and also naked as a needle at the time. Yeah. Anyway, um, David, that's a great question. Uh, David's asking, he says, what art thou? Um, is it because he's wondering, like, is he wanting to confirm? Is he actually trying to confirm that she's human here? Um, uh, I think it's possible. Um, Lancelot knows there's been sorcery afoot. Right. And remember, this is not Lancelot's first rodeo. Right. I mean, Lancelot has been on the receiving end of sorceresses attempting to get him in their beds for a long time. Uh, this is like practically a, a regular event 
for Lancelot. But this time, unlike those other times, the lady was successful, right? Um, so, David, I'm not sure if he is suspecting that, um, if he's suspecting that she is like a succubus or something. I, I mean, it's conceivable that she could be some kind of demon. Um, we'll see that that's indeed very plausible. But I don't think that that's what he's meaning. I think that what he, I, my suspicion is that what he's afraid of here when he says, tell me what thou art. It is possible that he just doesn't recognize her. Because, I mean, it has been it, er, several hours since he has seen this particular lady naked in front of him like she is right now. Uh, uh, we know how hard how hard a time people have recognizing folks under any circumstances uh, in this book. But I agree with you, David. I think there's more force to that what thou art than merely, hey, I don't recognize you. Who the heck are you? Um, my suspicion, if I had to guess, I would guess that he is wondering if she's going to do like a Scooby-Doo villain thing and like pull back her mask and show that it was really Morgan Le Fay or somebody like that, right? Or, or uh, you know, the necrophiliac sorceress or something like that. I, I think that that's what he's worried about. It's like, you're not really the king of the queen of North Wales in disguise or something like that, are you? Um, and she's like, no, 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 I'm I'm Elaine, the daughter of King Peles, right? I am who I, lo who I look like, right? Um uh, and he says, well, I will forgive you, right? Um, yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, good. Um, Yeah. Oh, Brian, I think you're you're very right. Um, Brian is pointing out, and I agree that this is a, this is a very important point. When Lancelot has his moment at the window, right when the enchantment passes, his thought is not, "I've been deceived. I am the victim. Right? I have been enchanted. What have what has been done to me?" Right. He does. He does call her a traitorous. Right. He does believe that he has. I mean, he knows he's been the victim of an enchantment. But Brian, I think, is very right to point out that his very first thought is that when he knows himself, when he comes back to his right mind, he knows that he has done amiss. Um, he has done wrong. He feels guilt. Not just outrage, but guilt. And that, I think, is interesting and important. Um, yes, he was deceived. Yes, he was enchanted. But it was his love for Guinevere that was exploited, right? Um, had he not transgressed... And again, you know, Brian, for me, I like that passage for my A reading of this, of this passage, right? If... Lancelot and Guinevere have not had sex yet. That line makes a lot more sense to me. He knew himself that he had done amiss. I didn't actually sleep with, Gwen with Guinevere, but I thought I did. And I really wanted to. And if I had not been willing to, I wouldn't have been in this situation, right? Um, I put myself in this situation because I was willing to cross that line, which I have not technically crossed right but i was i was i was vulnerable I, I so he is there is a sense in which he is now guilty of adultery right in his heart he's guilty of adultery with the queen he hasn't slept with guinevere but that's not his fault <laughs> right uh his innocence is not down to him um it is only technical and in his heart he has committed that sin um so that is my reading of that, David. I don't think he feels guilty for letting himself get tricked. I think that he has done a miss. He and uh, and then he draws his sword on Elaine, and he's going to feel bad for that later. That he should not have drawn his sword on her um, to to murder her uh, the morning after would have been wrong, even though she did wrong, right? Even though she victimized him. Uh, even though he has been the victim of a kind of rape. Um, he, 
Sir Lancelot does not decapitate ladies, right? That is, that is not, you know, there are some knights who might do that kind of thing, right? Lancelot is not one of them. Yes, the anger of shame is exactly what we see, Merowyn. Um, he is ashamed, and his anger towards her is fueled in, in, in part, I think, by his shame. Absolutely. Absolutely. Um, so, yeah, James, no, he doesn't have any choice when she asks him for mercy. Like, there is no question about what is the right thing to do here. Even if, even though he is the victim, even if she has done wrong, and she kind of has, uh, swapping her head off with his sword would be wrong. Like, that's, that's yes, that is non-negotiable. Okay. Guinevere is not happy. And so the noise sprang in King Arthur's court that Sir Launcelot had gotten a child upon a line, the doctor of King Pelles, wherefore Queen Guinevere was wroth, and she gave many rebukes to Sir Launcelot, and called him false knicht. And than Sir Launcelot told the queen all, and how he was mad to lie by her, in the likeness of you, my laddy queen. And so the queen held Sir Launcelot excuse it. Again, see, this is one of those passages which does not fit the A reading well at all, right? Um, you'd think if they have never had sex and Lancelot had decided that they should not have, have sex and feels that he has transgressed because he meant to have sex with Guinevere, even though he didn't, he wouldn't just be like, oh, honey, I thought it was you. And she's like, oh, okay, well, then that's fine, right? This, that, see, this whole exchange seems way too casual uh, to really fit with the A reading. Um, now, David, I don't mind the quick forgiving so much because this is not Guinevere's first rodeo either, <laughs> right? She knows full well that Sir Lancelot has been the victim of sorceress after sorceress, that, you know, one beautiful, scantily clad lady after another has been hurling herself at Sir Lancelot for decades now. Right. So um, on the one hand, you know, she's ready for this kind of thing. Right. Oh, so one of them succeeded. Right. And even the fact that she herself was sort of used right as the uh, mechanism. Right. For that deception. A little vexing. But in a sense, again, at least from his point of view, uh, uh, it, it definitely a, a, a moderating factor. Uh, for her. Um, now that's an interesting question. Michelle is wondering, could we read it that she was mad because he'd taken advantage of a damsel and gotten her pregnant? No, I don't think so. I mean, again, um, she is upset, I believe, just because he's been unfaithful, right? Um, If he's going to take this other damsel, Paramours, right, and sleep with her and beget a child on her, uh, that's not good, right? That is, un even if they're not, whether they're sleeping together or not, that would be wrong for him to do. Um, and she would be upset at his acting like that. Um, Yes, Brian, I do believe she, she forgives him because of the sorcery, right? He says that, and, and you're right, he was made to lie by her, right? Um, he says he was the victim, and she seems to accept that, right? She does seem to accept this as uh, as a, a form of rape, um, and does not blame him for that. Um, yes, good, Karita, you are right to remember that she. We know that this is part of her worldview, right? We know that she knows this kind of thing happens all the time, right? Because. Uh, Remember, as Carita is reminding us, she remember Guinevere in her letters telling La Belle Isode that Isode of the Blanchemans probably ensorcelled Sir Tristram, and that's why. Not actually true, but anyway, that yes, she was she was the one to come forward with the, you know, like you can't give those sorceresses an inch. Like everywhere you turn, there are these sorceresses who are trying to, you know, sleep with your. Lover, but don't take it hard, La Belle Zone, because, you know, this is just one of those occupational hazards that uh, we have to deal with as the lady friends of, you know, the number one and number two knight in the world. Because, uh, yeah, it happens. 
it has never succeeded before, but that doesn't necessarily seem to change things. Until she meets Elaine. And there's a frosty meeting between Elaine and Guinevere, uh, who perhaps, who seems to find Elaine uh, younger and more beautiful than she rather expected her to be. And upon seeing Elaine, she then requires Lancelot to come to her bed that night. And she says, I have to have you in my bed or else I, and I'm not going to be sure you're not hopping into her bed again. Right? So she says she forgives him, but there seems to be a still a little bit of uh, uncertainty about this. And she, I guess she seems to have looked at Elaine and said, okay, now I'm a little bit less sure that that was not consensual. Right? Um, so... But of course, Dame Brucen steps in again. So when time come that all folk is were to bed, Dame Brucen come to Sir Launcelot bed his side and said, Sir Launcelot du Lac, sleep ye? My laddie, Queen Guinevere, lieth and awaiteth upon you. Ah, my fire laddie, said Sir Launcelot, I am ready to go with you, whether you will have me. So Sir Launcelot threw upon him a long gown, and so he took his sword in his hand, and then Dam Brucen took him by the finger and laid him to her laddie's bed, Dam Elaine, and then she departed, that is, Brucen, not Elaine, and left them there in bed to getters. And wit you well, this laddie was glad, and so was Sir Launcelot, for he went that he had had another in his armas. The second time there's no wine. He goes to bed deliberately thinking again it's Guinevere. So he is once again attempting to commit adultery with Guinevere. Failing, but it is even less his fault that he's failing this time. Now leave we them kissing and clipping as was a kindly thing. And now speak we of Queen Guinevere that sent one of her women that she most trusted under Sir Launcelot's bed. And when she come there, she found the bed cold. He, and he was not therein, and so she come to the queen and told her all. Alas, said the queen, where is that false knight, false knight become? And so the queen was nigh out of her wit, and then she writhed and watered as a mad woman, and meek not sleep a four or a five hours. Okay. Um... <laughs> Karina thinks that Lancelot might have learned to be suspicious of the let me deal lady. Yeah, well, he doesn't know it's her again, like sorceress, right? So, um, uh, yeah, you would think that he might have checked her credentials a little bit better. But again, how would he know? Um, Gerald wants to know what's the purpose of this second time if Elaine is already conceived. I agree, Gerald, that whole, no, but I have to sleep with you in order to beget Galahad. It's super important, right? Uh that works the first time. She was extremely confident, however, that, you know, it took the first time, right? She, you know, the next morning she's like, this night you have begotten Galahad upon me. And uh, Devorah, was it you who is asking, yeah, what kind of pregnancy test she's using? She just knows she's from the foreign country. She knows, you know, what's supposed to happen. Um, so, um, she, but she just, she loves him. That's... That's Elaine's tragedy, right? She is this sort of chosen instrument by through whom Galahad is going to enter the world, right? She has been chosen to bear the greatest knight ever. Um, and that seems to be fine, and she's fine with that, and her father's fine with that, and everybody, and of course there's, you know, you, but, you know there's a prerequisite, like there's a part of that job, you know, like you can't just, be, um, because it's not, because, uh, you usually have to lose your virginity. Um, in almost every case, you have to lose your virginity before you can have the prophesied baby. Um, there have been ways around that, but it doesn't happen very often. So, uh, anyway, so she, but her tragedy is that she, fell in love with him and she now she wants to sleep with him just because she's in love with him and she's jealous too um lancelot is hers now um she's not envious <clears throat> um and notice that 
Guinevere seems to be both jealous and envious here, right? At the same time, she is envious of Elaine, I think envious of her beauty, for one thing, but also envious of the fact that she has slept with Lancelot, right? Again, that is a reading that makes much more sense with the A reading if Guinevere has not, in fact, had sex with Lancelot yet, right? Um, and she is now, it kind of toasts her cookies, right? That Elaine has slept with him and she hasn't. She has been the lover of Lancelot for a long time, right? Um, and she has never slept with Lancelot. And here Elaine has, right? And she's envious of that. She's also jealous of Lancelot, right? She, Lancelot is hers. Uh, they have been lovers for a long time. Like right? they've, they've been in this sinless relationship for a long time. He belongs to her, and she doesn't want to share him with Elaine. Elaine is also jealous, right? Lancelot is hers, she would argue, in a very different way than, uh, than he is Guinevere's, and she is going to hold on to him, and that's what's happening here, right? This is, uh, 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 Karita, just as you say, um, a territorial dispute, um, yeah, yeah. Um, okay. All right. You're right, Karina. It isn't toaster cookies. What is it? Froster cookies, right? That's, 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 that's using the metaphor properly, I guess. Though I've never understood that metaphor, really. Uh, uh, I was thinking of toasted cookies because it was unpleasant, but whatever. Anyway, doesn't matter. Um, I can still, I don't know, I can make this scene work with the A reading from Guinevere's point of view. I have a hard time with making it fit from Lancelot's point of view. If I can imagine how this combination of envy and jealousy that she is being gripped by here would lead her to say, okay, you know what? It's time to escalate, right? Lancelot and I have been loving each other sinlessly for a long time. I need to stake my claim here, right? Um, uh, I, I, it's time for us to uh, uh, take our relationship to the next and sinful, but higher level or greater, more profound level, right? Um, I can work that out. I can, I, that works for me. Lancelot's response, I, I can't fit it. I can't, right? That Lancelot would be like, okay, I'm ready to hop into your bed now. I mean, what is the argument that he he wakes up after sleeping with Elaine and he knows he's done a miss and he's like, oh, man, I crossed the line. I didn't actually sleep with Guinevere, but I did in my heart. Like I've committed adultery in my heart. I mean, is Lancelot being like, well, I've committed adultery in my heart, so I might as well commit it physically, too. Why not? Right. Might as well get hanged for a sheep as a lamb. I, I, I that doesn't really work for me at all. Um, uh, but. Um, yeah, I, yeah, Devorah, I, I know that T.H. White does exactly that kind of thing. Uh, I, maybe. I, I have a hard time with it. It doesn't work for me really well. And again, if that's what's going on, I'd expect a little bit more fanfare from the narrative than, you know, this just him being like, okay, honey, I'll be right there. And again, even like what he actually does. No wine. Again, remember, right? No wine. So he just, he hops into her bed and he starts clipping and kissing as was a kindly thing. Remember, kind means nature, right? So as is natural, right? When you find yourself hopping into bed with your beloved and she's probably in her needle-like state at this point. What, I mean, kissing and clipping, kissing and hugging, natural thing to do, right? Just ask his ode to the Blanche Mines. Um, but... Um, He's, I, the as was a kindly thing, I think, is his way of politely suggesting that they are, in fact, unlike is of Le Blanchemans going, uh, going past the clipping and kissing 
stage. I think he's not stopping at first base. But the point is, uh, here's Lancelot just blithely hopping into this. And again, I just, I can't see it. I can't see it. Um, yes, no, Michelle, there's no question that committing the sin in your heart. No, it's not the same thing as doing it in the flesh. Nobody would say that. Nobody would say that. Um, it's bad. Like, if you do, if you commit the sin in your heart, you've committed a sin. And, um, I mean, like, that's something you would need to confess and do penance for. But it's worse to do it in the flesh as well, especially afterwards, to be like, first I did it in my heart, which was bad, but then I'm going to ratify it in the flesh afterwards. That's, um, let me take this out of adultery. Let me take this out of the bedroom and put it in a different context, right? If you murder someone in your heart, if you fantasize about stabbing somebody, you've committed a sin, right? But nobody would say, well, since you murdered him in your heart last night, you might as well just go out and stab him today because it's just as bad, right? So, you know, like, it's, you know, nobody would say that. Yet actually murdering the person is worse than committing the sin in your heart. It's still a sin if you only commit it in your heart, but actually stabbing the person is worse. Same thing here, right? Fantasizing, but even attempt like d d d believing that you had like what Lancelot did is a really interesting kind of liminal state between sinning in your heart and sitting in the flesh right like he thought he was having sex with G with Gwenary but it wasn't really him so he's like let off on a technicality but it's a a a, 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 a sort of a faint technicality um and yet he still remains innocent of adultery for him on the strength of that to be like, well, might as well go ahead. Yeah, no, like morally, that's not um, it doesn't hold up at all. Um, yeah, yeah. Um, yeah. And, and Karina, exactly. The murder thing, it's definitely worse for the person being stabbed. Right. Similarly, <laughs> you know, he might be guilty, but Guinevere isn't yet. Right. So that by itself would be reason for him not to do it. So, yeah, it's just I, it's not the same. Um, so, again, it's a big deal. Definitely a sin, but not the same. OK. Well, all right. Look, I failed to do this even in one in, in one more class. Read the beginning of, of the quest. We're going to not only going to finish this, but we're going to get to the quest for the Holy Grail next time. Um, so we're going to start the San Creel. Read, um, read through section two. So read the departure and the miracles. OK, uh, which are what they're called in the uh, 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 in the. The Winchester text that we're working with here. Uh, so the first two sections of the quest. The quest for the Sancreo. Um Read those two next time. We'll finish up the Lancelot and Elaine story, and then we'll begin the quest for the Holy Grail next time. We will totally get to that, no problem. So, we're still not caught up yet, but we're we're still going to move forward anyway. But I got to let you go. It is super late. Thanks everybody for joining me, and for those of you who have uh, stuck with me uh, really late, I appreciate it, and I will talk to you guys next week. Good night, everybody. The Mythgard Academy has been offering in-depth discussions of awesome books and films since 2013, completely free to attend and free to download. If you've enjoyed our discussions and would like to help them continue, please consider donating at signumuniversity.org fund.